Hi everyone, I am Madhuri Karak and I want to welcome you back to the fifth edition of our series Rare Conversations in which we speak with a range of experts who are expanding the fields of sustainability, environment and conservation as we know it. Today we are with Dr. Roberta Katz, Senior Research Scholar at Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences and for today's purposes, she's also co-author of the upcoming book, Gen Z Explained, The Art of Living in a Digital Age. Thank you so much for joining us, Roberta. Thank you, Madri. There you are, welcome. Whereabouts are you joining us from today? I'm in Palo Alto, California today. Thank you. I saw the bamboo grow behind you, and then I caught myself thinking that's probably a Zoom background, but correct me if I'm wrong. No, it is a Zoom background, but it is, um, it is, it is my backyard. Uh, it's a photo of the backyard. Oh. I, I got tired of looking at my messy desk on these Zoom calls, and I realized that the backyard was a place of peacefulness. So I went out, took a picture and turned it into a Zoom background. So you're mentally joining us from your Palo Alto backyard. I love that. Yes. <laughs> mentally and physically, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. We're just super excited to dive into this new book that is soon coming out into the world. Um, I know you were trained as a lawyer and then as a cultural anthropologist, you know, you've worked in tech, you've worked in federal government, now you're in university administration at Stanford, and as if all that was not keeping you busy enough, you've now gone and co-authored this prescient, necessary even, I'd say, book on uh, Gen Z. So, Will you take me and our viewers on a little journey, a quick overview of how you got here? Sure, um, thank you. I, I do kind of joke and call it a checkered past, but uh, the, the, the further along I got in my career, the more I realized that it all, actually that these were strands that got knitted together um, as I, as I uh, went from different, different contexts to different contexts. The thing that has kept me uh, sort of consistent with all the different um, experiences I've had is my appreciation for people and my desire to build bridges among people. It, that, I think that's what led me to anthropology. It, it's what gave me the interest in social change. And then as I became a lawyer, it's what helped me help clients as because lawyering in many ways is simply helping people bridge their differences. Um, and so I, I realized over the course of this long career that applied anthropology is really what I have done throughout. And it's actually what led me to this study of Gen Z. I'll just say very quickly that the three co-authors and I were having dinner one night. We all have been working in academia and started talking about our common experience of the young students. We all noticed they were different in some ways that we could not understand, but we, we saw that they were different from prior years of undergraduates. And we, and we wondered why, and that really was the, the germ of the book. And obviously we are going to delve into your book, and I'm sure the viewers uh, we have joining us today are already intrigued by the title, but before that, we did some audience polling to kick off our time together. And uh, I'm super curious to see who we have in the room and what everyone's thinking. So Steph, will you share the results with us? So the first question was, you know, which of the following attributes about Gen Z is more surprising? And uh, perhaps, Roberta, this is not a surprise to you. The attribute that's surprising is that they're self-drivers who also care deeply about others. So I can guess what their assumption um, was previously. Right. 
I'd love to talk to both of the to to why that is surprising and and it was surprising to us as well. Um, one of the biggest surprises that we had doing this research was that when we asked, we, we interviewed over a hundred young people. They were they were in three different um, uh, institutions of higher learning: a community college, a university in um, in northern England, and Stanford. And so they they did represent. They were all in some form of higher ed, but very different kinds of uh, of uh, institutions. And and a lot of the book is based on these interviews, but the interviews are then reinforced with, we did uh, random samples with a, a rep, very reputable um, survey company of a thousand young people, some college educated, some not um, in, in the United States and a thousand people in Britain. And we also used an analysis, a linguistic analysis of the language that we found online for people of this age. One of the most surprising findings with all of this different methodology was it almost to a person in the interviews, when we asked what, what their preferred form of communication was, they said, in person. They really, and when we, when we asked why, they talked about the, the intimacy, they talked about the clarity, and um, that really did surprise us because everyone is, is very adept with using various forms of online communication, but they prefer in person. The self-driving part is, uh, comes from the fact that from the time these people were very young, they, they could get information for themselves. They, they had, a lot of these uh, young people had computers when they were quite young, um, 10 years old, maybe even younger in some cases, and they or the family had computers. And so they could go out and they could find information themselves. It wasn't necessarily good information, but it was information. That was one piece of it. Another piece of it was that these young people were living, were growing up in a time of absolute constant change. If you think back to 1995, and 1995 is kind of the, around 1995 is when people consider Gen Z to have started. And if you think about 1995 was the year that the, the World Wide Web really became accessible. That was the year browsers were introduced. That was the year Amazon sold its first book online. Um, and think about all the change that has happened since 1995, smartphones, the Great Recession of 2008, the introduction of artificial intelligence and robotics and genetic engineering and online banking and online everything, social media, all that has happened since 1995 while these young people were growing up. So it's been a time when it's been hard to be a parent guiding your children, giving advice as to what the future will look like. You as a parent were, we, we were all kind of struggling to, to figure out what was going on around us, let alone give advice to our kids. So the kids became quite adept at, at operating on their own. And then um, what became clear as they spent more time online and found community online and, and became um, very aware of the world at large, they they began to care very much about others. So it's reflected in their, in their emphasis on diversity. They are very protective of a range of identities. They are willing themselves to engage in a, in a quest for identity that, that is ongoing. They change identities all the time. They see a spectrum of possibilities for identity. Um, we've seen that certainly with gender. I, I'm so glad you brought up those uh, couple of attributes because I too was, you know, especially curious about, I think it's number three that they strive for diversity and then number five, which was the highly collaborative and social um, part. And, you know, I couldn't help but think how these commitments in a way also 
go right to the heart of what we at Rare value tremendously in our work with communities, right? So listening with empathy, right? So facing diverse perspectives. Um, how do we surface and shape behaviorally informed solutions to super complex environmental challenges, right? Anything from how do we encourage more folks to adopt plant-rich diets all the way to how do we get artisanal fishers to kind of maintain their no cat zones, right? So you have the full range. And so it's perhaps no surprise that with attributes like diversity, collaborative problem solving, that this generation is really at the forefront of the climate challenge. And so, you know, I really wanted to hear you sort of piece together the attributes piece of it with, you know, their real kind of commitment, interest, passion um, for the environment and climate and how you saw that play out in your research. Yes, um, uh, there are a couple of things I want to say about that. Um, one, because they had such early exposure to what was going on in the world, they became aware very early of the existential threats that I think increasingly the whole the whole population is is acknowledging, and and for them it hit very hard. They're young. Um, for people, you know, baby boomers like myself, it's kind of like, okay, it's coming, but it's it's less likely to affect me than it will my grandchildren. And these grandchildren are looking at their futures and going, what can I expect? So um, when we asked our, um, in the survey and in the interviews, when we asked what worried people the most or what or to list their various fears and they talked about injustice and they talked about gun dangers and they talked about a, a, a range of things but the number one issue they brought up in both the survey and in the interviews was climate change so that is one point the second point is that they are one thing that uh, i i like to emphasize for people is is that the internet and the world wide web they, they are about communication. These are communication tools and they're more powerful tools than, than we've ever had for communication because for three, for three reasons, scope, it, it covers all the information you can put into it, scale, same thing, and speed, it, everything is fast. And so they have, because they grew up with this tool, they're very adept at using this tool, and they're very adept at um, at at understanding how to mobilize using the tool. So, I mean, if you if you think about people who grew up with Wikipedia or GoFundMe or some of these other collaborative efforts as a norm, as a as something that you just accept, you you can use you can use these tools to address. Um, climate change and the and you know we look at what Greta Thunberg has done and you can see you you can see that the the power of spreading the message and mobilizing people has uh, has been accentuated and they're good at that but the, we wrote the book in part because we want to make it. Uh, we want to promote more understanding of where these young people are coming from on the part of older people, but we also want younger people to understand why their experience growing up has been so different so that they can have more understanding of older people, you know, the okay boomer rolling of the eyes kind of thing of you grown ups don't know what you're talking about um, is also a problem. So the whole idea again was to build a bridge. So these young people, we need to figure out, we older people need to figure out how to work well with the younger people. The younger people need to work better with us, the older people, in dealing with climate change. Yeah, I, I really also always note that community orientation, right? Like I think previous generations and for structural reasons, of course, have tended to be more individualistic but you know here you see a real efflorescence of 
community and community mindedness, yes. which I know um, climate wise, we're in big trouble, but just the orientation again, gives me so much hope and inspiration. And, and like you say, there's just so much potential for dialogue and learning. So, and this brings me to the next question, which is you know about intergenerational dialogue as a fellow anthropologist, I you know, noticed how you approach Gen Z as another culture, right? With its unique values, its vocabulary, its predilections, its preoccupations. And, you know, we are in this historical moment for better or for worse, where having any kind of dialogue is super fraught, right? It doesn't matter uh, what it's really about. And, and so why do you think having intergenerational dialogues are hard, but imperative, right? And will thinking of generations as cultures kind of help us get to that point of intergenerational dialogue? Oh, I love that question, Madhuri. It's, and it is, again, reflecting your own experience as an anthropologist. Um, we did approach this as a cultural study. I think, you know, anytime you have a group, the group is going to share some practices, some values, some beliefs, and that is a culture. So we have, we have big cultures and we have small cultures. Because we wanted to understand where these students, at the, we started with these students were coming from, we didn't want to pre, presuppose that we understood them. You know, there had been so much negative um, sort of so many epithets about the generation. They were called snowflakes and they were called, you know, lazy and so on and so forth. And, and we, we said, we want to hear from you. That's why the title of the book is Gen Z Comet Explained. We wanted their explanation of, of who, they, who they feel they are. And, and, and it was interesting because when we started to ask them about their values, we thought they might resist, but on the contrary, they leaned in. They wanted to talk about their values. Um, high on their list of values was something that surprised us. It was called flexibility. And we hadn't even thought of that as a value from our, from our uh, sort of age bias, as it were. But they have grown up, as they explained, with so much constant change that they needed to be flexible. They had no idea what, how long their jobs would last and so on. So we did approach this very much in a listening, a non-judgmental listening mode. And what we've tried to do in the book is reflect what they've said with some historical analysis. One of the co-authors is a historian. And, 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 and to present it kind of on its face, so that others can um, can 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 think about it uh, and and can engage in dialogue. As I said before, my my career has been devoted to building bridges, and that's what this book we hope will do: is increase cross generational understanding, which is so needed given the scale of the problems we are facing, not least of which is is climate change and. And so, but, but again, this bridging is done person to person. So we've tried to bring the voices of individuals to bear. The book is full of their commentary. And because I think that is how we best uh, connect with each other. And I love that Rare does that, goes into communities and listens and then brings what Rare has to offer to to a community that then can engage in dialogue. The dialogue is so important. And I think societally, we are just finding our way to, um, to how to do a better job of dialogue. We're, we're going through a, what I call a birthing process to, um, to a society that, that is uh, operating at much bigger scale than society used to operate because of the new digital tools. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> it was perfect. And this is actually gonna be my last question because we have questions from the audience coming in and I'm going to turn this over to our viewers soon.
But speaking of you know, interdisciplinary dialogues, you know, you've mentioned your colleagues, your co-authors on the book, you have a historian, you had a linguist, you of course, um, we're talking about intergenerational dialogues. And you know, it seems to me that your interest really has been about fostering understanding, right? Between people, about people, their motivations, their constraints, what makes them tick, um, what inspires them. And this, you know, I really discern a kind of running theme. And, you know, for Rare, for us in the environmental space, I think it's really this emphasis, right, on contextual, immersive understanding, right? It just makes so much sense. And yet we aren't quite there yet. Right. So I think the last question I you know, have for you to borrow from John C. Lee Brown's famous phrase a little bit, how can we ride the white water better? Right. And how can we be better at fighting for our humanity alongside Gen Z? Right. And really move past the sort of incendiary polarizations and kind of cut to the chase, get to the heart of the matter, and really spend some time listening. Oh, so the oh white my. water. Okay, I, I, oh, I, I love the question and I love the sentiment behind the question. Accepting the degree of change and not trying to hang so tightly onto the past is crucial. Young people have, do not have a past to hang on to they are necessarily having to look at the future. Those of us who've grown up before, understandably, want it to go back to how it was, even if it wasn't quite as wonderful as we remember it as being. And for those of us who are older, again, understanding the world as it is seen by these younger people, I hope will help us keep a future oriented perspective in mind and not be afraid of that. And I think fear is driving so much of what is going on right now. And I'm not trying to say young people have all the answers. They're young, their, their idealism, their lack of experience is a factor, but they are necessarily having to look to the future and we owe it to them to work with them on that. So it's, again, that might reflect my own idealism, but it is what, what drives me. Onward and upward is yes. your answer. I have many questions filtering in, so maybe we just go in order. That's usually a good place to start. So the first question I have is, how applicable would your research results be to Gen Z in developing countries? So that is a, that's an excellent question. We only looked at people in the United States and Britain, English speaking for the most part. And we say in the book that we don't know how universal our findings will be. We, um, we know we were surprised at the continuity of response or the similarity of response between people in the US and Britain and, and between uh, young people in these three very different institutions of higher learning. There was remarkable, we had a, a professional survey um, analyst going through the results with us and he was dumbfounded at the similarity in the responses. He said, you just don't see that. And, and the only thing we can imagine is that the internet is creating a more common experience for young people. So it will depend, I think, on how uh, computer literate uh, people elsewhere are and, and and how um, and and how what they see online meshes with their own experience in their day to day lives. Yeah, and even just context and you know mobility, right? I, mean, exactly. I didn't even know about 
the millennial as a category until I came to the US for graduate school. Right. And then it's like, oh yes, I guess I am that thing. Yeah. And now it's like, yes, I am that thing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. it took about yeah. a decade, give or take, but uh, I'm now firmly invested and bought into uh, a generational category that didn't originate from my social context, but, you know, now is one I inhabit fully. So, um, okay. We well, have and let, me, let me just add that we, we say in the book, we hope other, other uh, researchers will look at young people in these other right. cultures, because it will be wonderful to compare. Right, exactly. For future research directions, yeah. it's yeah. A, a really interesting um, next step to pursue. And the second question is actually also about your research methodology. It's asking, how homogenous did you find Gen Z to be? Uh, and how well is your sample able to speak to this in a generalizable way, given its you know, representativeness? Uh, given that you were mostly collecting data in universities. And then do you think your findings apply to conservative Gen Z members as well as to liberal members? Yes, good, excellent questions also. Uh, several things to say. One, ethnographic research is always going to be more qualitative than quantitative. And no matter how many interviews you do. Um, and they, so homogeneity, is not, you're always going to find a, a spectrum of individual difference. What we were looking for was, uh, and all the, all the interviews were recorded so we could go back and read them again and again and again. And, and we, we deliberately had our um, research assistants ask very uh, common questions, but in an open-ended way to get, we wanted to get depth. And, um, I hope people will read the book because again, there's so much of the, the, the voices of these young people. And you can tell in those voices, there is a lot of difference. However, what we found and what we highlighted were the commonalities, which go more to values. And values are just sort of shared values. And the obvious one was gender because we've seen this over and over in the in the media, the difference between how older people approach gender in a, and how younger people are doing it. But it, it, it showed up in many other ways. The reason we used the surveys was we wanted to see how generalizable what we were finding would be. And the surveys again were random samples, a thousand people in the US, a thousand people in Britain in this age group many of whom were not college educated. And there was, there, was a, there was surprising, again, consistency between what we were hearing in the interviews and what we were seeing in the surveys. And in terms of conservative versus liberal, there, again, there will be, there's a spectrum of views, but um, in the book, there are, uh, we, from articles that we read from Pew Research surveys and so on, we were able to see um, a variety of political orientations, as it were, and, and bring that into where we saw similarity and where we didn't. Yeah, and this sort of continues nicely along those uh, features that you were highlighting. So the next question is, to what extent do you think Gen Z is adept in handling conflict and failure? They are, they are not adept. They're no more adept than any of the rest of us. They are, I like to see what's going on right now as value conflicts. We have good value conflict conflicts as a society between our desire for privacy and our desire for security online. That has been one. Um, the, there, there's, there's some wonderful uh, survey data done by the Knight Foundation about on campuses about conflict between freedom of speech, the importance of freedom of speech, and the importance of, um, of not having hate speech. 
And so these conflicts, these are value conflicts that always happen in times of major change. That's why I call what we're going through right now a birthing process. Just like happened when industrial technology started, there was a huge disruption. If you, know, if you think about what you read about in the history books, because moving from an agrarian life to life in the cities and life in factories, and you know, that was the beginning of public schools and new forms of courts and so on. That those, and those, those got um, dealt with with value change. We are in the midst of that right now as a society. What I can say is that young people are, because they're trying to be very creative and problem solving, there are lots of young people trying to experiment with better ways of doing things. And there are older people. There's a project at Stanford called Deliberative Democracy that is focused on bringing people of very different political views together to work on, to, to have dialogue. So we're, we're at the beginning of a process and young and old, we're all in the midst of it. And I'm really appreciating how you're, you know, consistently challenging us to rephrase our Gen Z focused questions as we questions and not they questions, right? That it's a mutual relationship of, you know, constitution and reciprocity and not they are there and we are here. So mm -hmm. I'm really, you know, enjoying how you're challenging us to reframe that binary thinking. So um, thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Um, the next viewer question, and I'm partial to this question, so I'm going to ask this one. Um, <laughs> speaks to, could you speak to how cultural anthropology adds to behavioral sciences and to conservation in particular? Yes. Um, I, the reason, I, I actually think anthropologists as a, or anthropology as a discipline undersells itself um, when they uh, teach in the academy. What I, and, and I have alluded to this a couple of times already, but it allows you to approach difference with an open mind. And anthropology allows you to, to accept and appreciate diversity in the world. And, and to, if you think about conservation, the, the, the healthiest ecosystems are those that are diverse. The ecosystems that are at most, in most jeopardy are those that lose that diversity. Well, we humans also constitute a form of an ecosystem and anthropologists have the, the skill set to, um, to help, again, bridge difference, uh, acknowledge difference, explore difference. And that is, that is unique among the social sciences. Uh, but we, we, we tend to undersell ourselves. Definitely agree on the underselling part. I have another question coming in where a listener is asking, there's been discussion of generational bridge building. How does trust fit into that? Mm -hmm. And how do you build trust with a community or a culture or a generation that you are not a part of yourself? Oh, beautiful question. You know, trust has been, there are all these surveys that have done been done over the last 10, 15 years about the decline of trust in our society. One of the aspects of uh, these young people that we talk about at length in the book is they really value authenticity. And authenticity doesn't necessarily mean that you won't um, kind of wear makeup or present yourself in a, in a false way, even online, but it does mean that you will be honest in saying that's what you're doing. You know, these young people grew up with advertising, with fake news, with, and so they, they have a hunger for, for honesty, I guess you could say. And again, doesn't mean that you can't represent yourself differently. You just have to be clear about that, that that is what you are doing. So 
I think building trust, I, part of understanding someone else and, or trying to understand where they're coming from is a, is a, is a step toward building trust. Are you who you say you are? Can I count on that? And I think that's true for institutions as well as individuals. And we've lost trust in institutions because frankly, there is a lot of hypocrisy. Difficult truths to grapple with. Um, I have a viewer with a question from France. So they are writing in, Roberta, as a university scholar, I work a lot with students who belong to Gen Z, and you're surely aware of the phenomena of learned helplessness. And sometimes I witness with my students that they're very disillusioned when it comes to just where the world is going due to the things older generations have done wrong and that they can't do anything anyway to turn things around. And our viewer is sharing that they're a millennial themselves and can surely empathize, but that they don't really know how to encourage them to keep their hopes up for a better future if they themselves acknowledge how bleak things are. Right. And so, you know, they are just curious if you've had similar experiences and then what advice um, would you share um, in done. Right. Oh, we talk about this a lot in the book. I hope this person will read the book. Um, we, um, they, they have, they are very pragmatic. The, the people that we, these young people are more pragmatic than I think we, many of their elders are. So they feel like they have a huge amount on their shoulders, which can feel too heavy. We talk a lot about the mental health issues for this generation, which, which I think are not dramatically different from the mental health issues facing all of us, um, you know, older people as well, but they just get emphasized about younger people. So they, but what I, what we talk about in the book is that part of their, their reliance on each other and their desire to collaborate is one way they are helping each other do something together and not feel isolated and helpless. The other thing we talk about a lot in the book is how they've used memes, humor. They, they use a lot of sort of sardonic, sarcastic humor to create some solidarity, but that solidarity is really important in the face of these big problems. And, and partly, you know, where in the past we might have turned to our elders as the as the 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 person sending in the question acknowledges, they can't necessarily turn to the elders. We don't have the answers. I just also want to encourage our viewers, if you're sitting with a burning question, don't be shy, don't hesitate, just uh, pop them in the QA and uh, we'll be sure to ask Roberta your questions. Um, I have another question actually from, uh, again, a teacher and they're asking whether you got any insight into how Gen Z thinks about formal education mm -hmm. and the implications uh, that there might be on climate literacy of you know, the teachers entrusted um, to educate Gen Z? That's a sort of two-part question. Um, this this um, self-agency, self-reliance uh, characteristic that we talked about, the attribute, does make them a little less um, willing to take at face value what educators say. And, and I, I know, um, we are changing some of the techniques in education so that the teacher is more of a guide than a sort of didactic knower of, 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 of what, what should be known. Um, so it, it, does, it does bear, I think, on the future of uh, certainly higher education. You know, K through 12, 
students don't have a lot of choice, but with higher education, they do. There is a sense that we all have to have lifelong learning now because jobs are not as reliable as or, or as sort of long lasting as they used to be and people need to be ready to to train themselves in new fields. Um, and I do think higher education itself is um, is like all institutions right now experiencing a need for some change. Um, the other part about education and climate, climate issues per se, there is a hunger for that knowledge. So while they are, these uh, young people are more self-reliant, they do want to hear from, they, they very proactively want to go and find experts to help them solve the problems. And, and experts in climate change, I think are going to be valued for that reason. You know, you look at some of the humanities fields and students can be very dismissive. They don't understand what the relevance is and it's incumbent on those teachers, whether it's literature, history, whatever, to, to demonstrate why it is relevant to today and tomorrow and not just the past. My call for questions has had results and um, getting uh, more than a trickle now. So a couple of questions here that I can actually chime in and answer. Uh, one viewer wants to know what we at RARE are doing with uh, young people and if there are ways for them to get involved with our work. Yes, absolutely. We are you know, working on a few very specific youth oriented initiatives. And one of which is the Behavior Change for Our Future Fund. And this is a younger donor giving circle that we're building out at the moment and I'm really excited about. So Steph is uh, going to drop some of these details in the chat and ditto with volunteering with us. And again, um, Stephanie is going to be your friend in the chat if you want to follow up more on Rare's work and how to get involved. Okay, back to our regularly can scheduled I, programming can I, with Roberta. Can I offer one other thought? Um, yes. I don't know, I, I know you have some younger people on the board um, and as your advisors, and I've been pushing lots of organizations to uh, bring, bring those voices into the boardroom as well in some form. And I think that just goes back to your earlier point about, you know, widening the tent, getting more diverse voices to the table because they will only enrich our perspectives and solutions for the really gnarly challenges in hand. So um, more is good. <laughs> um, let's see, I have another question about cultural anthropology again, where our viewer is asking, what is exciting to you right now in the field of anthropology and how you know, those trends are interfacing with the environmental space? Mm -hmm. um, I think if it's, what is exciting to me is um, continuing to, I'm gonna use the words again, build bridges. So because of some of my prior work in technology, um, I am also involved right now in a lot of conversations about the role of big tech in our society. And again, it's I, social change has always has always intrigued me. And um, I found, you know, because I was in the cellular industry, as that was blooming and then in the in the software industry the internet industry as that was blooming and taking off um, i've had an opportunity to watch change and participate in change and that continues to drive me um, i change is a time that is very always hard for people and and yet it's happening and 
how to make that easier uh, and less frightening is, is always of interest to me. I have another interesting methodological question uh, for you um, with a clear positioning, which makes me think this uh, listener might be an anthropologist themselves, I don't know. Um, they write, I'm a millennial in a graduate program with many Gen Z students, as well as a Gen Z sibling. Do you feel these traits, the 10 attributes um, that we shared earlier in the poll are on a spectrum or whether you think they're shared with millennial and older generations or are a completely new um, set of values and whether you see any causative reasons for these new values emerging besides technology and pressing global concerns? So, oh, very good question. Um, they are not necessarily new. For example, the focus on identity and, and di discovering who you are. Back in the, in the 60s and 70s, we had the free to be you and me um, kind of, uh, uh, it, it, that, that was introduced, I, you know, when I was raising my kids, I know there was a, there were, all, there were all kinds of books and records and about, I'm free to, you know, discover who you are. What, what has changed, and it is, it is largely um, technologically driven in this regard, is the scale, the scope, and the speed. Because again, this is, a, this, the internet is all about communication. And if you think about communication, it's at the heart of everything we do. And young people, all of us probably increasingly are in communication all the time, even more than we used to be. So though the, the, these attributes, some of them, and we talk in the book, we do give historical kind of explanations of where some of these have come from and how they have changed. And they have been in some cases uh, uh, highlighted, emphasized because of technology. And of course, technology alone is not a factor. Technology makes social change and social change then drives further social change. So it, you can't just say it's technology alone, but we look at what, what are the tools of living and how do they influence what we do? I'm going to steal that phrase from you, tools for living. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice one. I'm going to combine two questions uh, that just came in. So think of it maybe as a too far. How can the older generation assist Gen Z to organize constructively on climate change activism? And then what message would you give, maybe we give, to young people who dream of combating climate change? Mm. Let me answer the second part first. The message will be, we're, we're right here with you. Um, and, and to a certain extent, we're sorry, we didn't do more before. Um, I think that's what's so dis disappointing to young people is that they, so much of this has been evident, but, um, but again, human beings are sometimes uh, slower to address problems until they become bigger. The problems become bigger and more apparent. But I think it's okay to acknowledge that and to say, look, we are here with you. And that goes to the second part of the question um, or the first part, I guess which is um, how can we help? I think one, giving that message that we appreciate, uh, participating when they get together and organize. Um, and, and I wanna just say again, that it was important in the book for young people, we hope young people will read it to understand how different their experience has been from that of we their elders. And so, um, they need to also respect that we have something to offer and, and getting that, that mutual respect going then allows people to work together better. 
So there are examples out there of, and we have a couple in the book of young people and older people working together to uh, solve some problems. I don't know that we have them on climate change per se, but we have them in some other areas. I have a question that I think nicely alludes to, you know, your sort of let's build our future orientation muscle, where a viewer is asking, as you're looking at the difference and evolution between generations, what can we expect from generation alpha? the one after Gen Z. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for those who don't know, Generation Alpha is, is generally viewed as having been born after 2010, more or less. And it, one of the interesting things in our interviews was when we asked uh, our interviewees what they were worried about, they sounded like they were 50 year olds when they would talk about their younger siblings. Oh, I just, you know, they're, they're doing terrible things online. They're using applications that they shouldn't be. They're getting their, their phones too young, on and on and on. Um, I, I think uh, Generation Alpha, and I, again, I, I can't speak to that with any authority because haven't tried to talk to them in any rigorous way. But if anything, they are even more pragmatic. They 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 are seeing that you know they have definitely grown up at a time of techno skepticism in contrast to gen z which at least when they were young it was a time of techno optimism so and the big problems have not been solved so if anything we may expect that they are going to uh feel even even more burdened uh we had we in the book we quote one young probably Gen Alpha person um, who made the comment at one point, he said, I don't understand why my parents are so worried about me being online. I'm much more likely to be killed in my classroom than, than to be hurt online. And these kids are growing up, at least in the US with, with the issue of, of uh, you know, guns and and certainly the injustice, diversity, inequity issue is front and center for them at a very early age. So it's my best guess. So you have a topic for your next book is what I'm <laughs> yeah. um, So our time together is drawing to a close. And, you know, again, I'm listening to you and noting these continuities between your research, Roberta, and how we at RARE approach the environment and our programming priorities. And, you know, one of course is that empathy is this really important tool for solving complex problems. And then two, that we need diverse intergenerational voices at the table, right? And again, historically, right, if you, look back at Rare's inception, it was students in St. Lucian classrooms who were really instrumental in building that community-wide momentum and then bringing back the St. Lucian parrot from the brink of extinction. And I just never get tired of listening to that story. So for those of you who are new to Rare, I'll uh, ask Steph to leave, oh, she's already ahead of me. It's in the chat. <laughs> um, so yes, and again, I can't end this without a shout out to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who through their visionary leadership has actually awarded Res B Center a challenge grant to accelerate the adoption of people-centered conservation solutions. So. We are really excited to collaborate with more diverse partners on even a more diverse range of environmental challenges. You see how I'm already calling back to the <laughs> 10 attributes of Gen Z. Um, but thank you, Roberta, for joining us for this really invigorating and inspiring discussion, really. And as a reminder to all of you, Roberta's book is available for pre-order now. It is out 
mid-November? Yes, very soon. I, the, the press told me it will be out very soon and you can find it at the, on the University of Chicago Press website. Uh, that, that will be the earliest availability. Okay, awesome. And I think just going by the conversation that we had today and all the questions that folks chimed in with, you know it's going to be an amazing read. So I encourage all of you to pick up a copy and thank you again so much for joining us from your corner of the world. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Madri.